And then for the final talk of this session, we've got um, Mr. Andrew Chakamata from um, Imperial College in London, and he's going to tell us about the future, which is really interesting, um, and whether it may involve the sutureless aortic valve or not. Thank, Thank you very you. much, David. Um, yes, the future of uh, sutureless aortic valve replacement. I think if you're going to talk about the future, it's quite important to start with an understanding of the past. We've all, or several people have alluded to this uh, um, point this morning already. Um, this data was taken from the uh, Blue Book, which is, this is an old iteration, and it goes back to, uh, uh, up to 2008, and we're expecting a new one shortly. But it shows you the change in the distribution of cardiac surgical workload in recent years. So this reduction in coronary surgery, despite a overall approximate plateau in numbers has been uh, uh, made up by an increase in valve surgery. And that is really driven by this uh, increasing the elderly population, uh, older patients having cardiac surgery, and a huge percentage of those are having aortic valve surgery. You see the same trend over the years. And the age at which they're having aortic valve surgery is also going up. But there's still a problem in that a lot of patients are still not getting treatment when they need it, still not getting the surgery that they need. And it's on the background of this that TAVI has uh, really taken off because the folk who started pushing TAVI in the early days were addressing unmet need. Whatever surgeons may feel about TAVI, there's no question that there was unmet need and TAVI was seeking to address that. Just as an aside, to indulge, if you, if you may, if you will, my um, interest in uh, medical history. Um, whenever I think of that unmet need, I think of some of the pioneers who also set out to un address unmet need. And one of them was this man, um, Russell Brock, consultant thoracic surgeon at Guy's, and really a champion innovator. If you look at his qualifications, uh, qualified 1920s, fellowship same year as he qualified, did surgical research in 1931. Who was doing that? He was knighted, became president of the Royal College of Surgeons, went to the House of Lords, and it was only then the physicians decided to give him the FRCP. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, just one more Brock story, sorry, indulge me. Um, Brock was quite a tyrant. I'm told that this picture was uh, taken after he'd heard a particularly funny joke. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was fortunate enough to be a uh, Jules Jusex registrar, and Jules was a medical student at Guy in Brock's time. He told the story of uh, Brock's registrar going up to him and saying, um, uh, Mr. Brock, um, my wife's just had our first child. Um, could I go and see them? And Brock just turned around and walked away. And one week later, one week later, he went up to the registrar and said, I suppose you'd better go. I don't know how today's trainees would deal with that. Um, but those pioneers, this is 1966, and Thomas says triple valve replacement patients survived. They got good results. Another pioneer, Dwight Harkin, major in the US Army, uh, performed the first uh, consecutive series of survivors of open heart surgery in a field hospital in Gloucestershire um, during the Second World War. His contribution to valve, to valve surgery was giving us these Ten Commandments um, for what a valve should look like and what it should achieve. Some of the things are really obvious. It shouldn't propagate emboli. Um, it must close promptly. It must have lasting physical and geometric features. The history of valve surgery is littered with valves which really did not achieve this. And what we must bear in mind is that a valve, any device, is safe only when it's safer than the condition it corrects. With that in mind, we have to look at what I think uh, is a very exciting development um, in uh, valve surgery, and that's sutureless aortic valve technology. This technology does owe a considerable debt to TAVI. It was uh, the developments in TAVI which prompted the valve manufacturers to start thinking about what they could do with their existing bioprostheses to either develop TAVI valves or something else, and the first sutureless valves came out of that, came from that agenda. There are now uh, on the market uh, two sutureless aortic valves. There was a third. And uh, going back to Harkin's Ten Commandments, I think that explains the reason why this, the uh, enable valve, you'll have some experience of that. 
did not uh, find long-term favour and has now been withdrawn. But if we briefly go through the two which are on the market currently, you've got the uh, Percival valve uh, from Soren and the Edwards Intuity valve. Um, both been around for similar time. Uh, both cover um, a wide range of uh, annular diameters, both bovine pericardial valves. The tissue treatments, I don't actually know what that means at sort of company speak. They all claim that their valves um, last longer than anyone else's. But uh, a major difference between the two is that um, this is self-expanding and this is balloon expanded. This is collapsible, this isn't, uh, and this can be retrieved, uh, this, with great difficulty. Um, fortunately, these valves have now been around long enough that we've got uh, some data on them. Uh, you know, over 100 publications on this, uh, the Soren Sutureless valve now, and more than 10,000 implants worldwide. <coughs> I will just focus on the, uh, the, the Soren Percival valve, um, declaration of, uh, uh, not a conflict of interest, declaration of interest, I am a proctor for Soren um, uh, Percival valve implant, so this is the one I know best. Um, and if I just describe the valve, it's a bovine pericardial valve, that's actually just a Soren mitroflow flow valve, um, housed in a nitinol stent, um, with this annular portion uh, holding buttonholes which guiding sutures will, through which guiding sutures will be placed when the valve is deployed. You can see the suggestion from the shape is that uh, these uh, sinusoidal struts will conform uh, to the geometry of the aortic root uh, and it's the radial force of this uh, nitinol as it expands, as it heats up, that keeps the valve in place. You're going to see uh, uh, some movies of this later so I won't dwell on it too much. Um, and as I say, the geometry is important. Um, one, another one of the reasons why this didn't really work was because of the stresses on the valve at these uh, particular points, uh, leading to early um, uh, structural valve deterioration. So how does the, uh, what does the Percival look like and how does it work? Um, I've described the valve. It comes together with all of this kit and uh, you essentially uh, use that to collapse the valve down uh, and it's held at the end of a, a, a holder. And you might just be able to make out the buttonholes through which guiding sutures will be placed. An important thing to point out, I think it's important, is that the valve is collapsed and not actually crimped like a TAVI valve. So um, I'm sure Mr. Graham has done this. Um, you know, when uh, you're implanting a tissue valve and the registrar goes at the leaflets of the forceps and you have to hit their hand to get away from the leaflets, if we take that, if we're so careful about that in surgery, how on earth does Tavi get away with crimping this valve right down so that it can go up the femoral artery? I don't know, and I wonder whether what the durability data will say in due course. This is a kind of halfway house. Yes, the thing is not uh, held perfectly open as a normal bioprosthesis, but it's not crimped either. Um, so the personal valve um, is the only actually sutureless valve uh, on the market. The uh, Edwards valve actually does require you to tie um, a couple of stitches down. And I think that, that um, the, the valve allows, uh, we, we've heard that aortic valve replacement is uh, safe, reproducible, but it can be challenging, especially the small aortic root, LB patients, calcified aorta. I think this technology greatly simplifi simplifies that. It does avoid trauma to the aortic root. Um, you can see what you're doing. Um, and uh, we'll hear again that it does facilitate minimally invasive approaches uh, for aortic valve replacement, allowing them to be more re reproducible. So uh, how's it implanted? You have to do a transverse aortotomy, quite high. If for a medium-sized uh, Percival valve, uh, you need three and a half centimeters from the aortic annulus. So that's a high aortotomy for most people. Um, uh, and it has to be transverse because this valve has to sit in the aorta and the radial force holds it in place. Uh, you uh, resect the leaflets, the calcified leaflets. How much you resect, there's still debate about. Uh, I'm sure we'll come on to that. Um, and then you have to pass a proline suture through the nadir of the annulus. Okay, so mid commissural it's not always mid commissural you have to actually have to look for the lowest point. Um, and then the valve is on the holder, you bring that up, you pass the guiding sutures through the loops on the valve, and you uh, that's not going to play. And you uh, drop the valve uh, into the annulus, 
uh, release it, and that's that, no tying of sutures. So what are the potential benefits of this technology? Well, I think the ease of implantation should, in reasonable hands, result in shorter cross clamp time and a shorter bypass time. And that means you're now opening the field for more of those high-risk patients with uh, uh, comorbidities and those uh, of advanced age. And we've heard many times already how the population is aging, and a lot of those patients have uh, severe aortic stenosis, which can be severe. I think it's also of assistance when you're doing concomitant procedures. So 40% of patients having aortic valve replacement will also be having the bypass grafts. And more and more, we're seeing they're having multiple bypass grafts. Cross clamp times creeping up, bypass times creeping up, you can anticipate uh, more complications. If you can reduce the time taken to do one aspect of the operation, I think there should be an advantage there. What's important about sutures technology, I think, is that it adheres to established surgical principles. So you're seeing what you're doing, you're excising the disease valve, you're removing calcium, and that's really in contrast to TAVI, where uh, whichever valve is used, you essentially open the disease valve, disease calcified valve, leave it in place, and put another uh, valve inside it. I think that's why TAVI still has this Achilles heel, dual Achilles heel of paravalvular leak, not surprising when there's that calcium still around there, and uh, the risk of embolization. You've just opened up uh, a calcified valve. We, we know what happens in theatre when you start fiddling with a calcified valve, bits can fly off. Um, and that's uh, the case whether it's just plain balloon uh, aortic valvuloplasty or TAVI, that risk is there. And again, uh, I think <coughs> uh, minimally invasive aortic valve replacement, many people do it. We're going to hear later how it can be made very straightforward, but I think this uh, could make it even easier. So these valves have now been around long enough for people to have written systematic reviews. Um, and I think the take home message from this first uh, uh, meta analysis, actually, of sutures AVR, looking at 12 studies over 1,000 patients, is that they clearly demonstrated reduced cross clamp and bypass times, reduced peak and mean gradients. Uh, and uh, one thing that's very often forgotten is uh, if you saw the design of the valve, the um, portion of the stent that sits in the uh, annulus, LVOT essentially, um, is small and it's thin. So you do get really good um, post operative hemodynamics for these valves. It's not a stentless valve but it's better than a traditional stented valve with a reasonable sized um, uh, sewing ring, et cetera. Does this matter? I mean, when I first started doing this, the, the, the most common comment, negative comment I would get from people would, would be, um, but so what if your cross clamp time is only 40 minutes, mine's only 25, you know, what, what are you achieving? And I would say to them, that, that's very good. You must be an excellent surgeon, but I can't quite match that speed. Uh, but in the back of my mind, I'd be thinking, I just don't believe you. Because uh, <laughs> we've all had the situation where you give cardioplegia and just taking out the disease valve will, can take you 20 minutes and that's a whole cardioplegia run. So how these folk think they're doing the whole thing in 25 minutes is, is uh, you know, undubious. Um, but does it matter? Well, I think it does. I think um, the data on uh, the complications related to cross clamp time, bypass time, are from a previous era. Um, and we've all got used to the idea that cardioplegia is that good and we've got good oxygenators and it, you know, does it matter that much? Actually, it does. And this um, uh, data from uh, Liverpool recently shows that even in the modern era, all the modern kit, um, prolonged uh, bypass cross clamp times still uh, affect complications and mortality. Um, so, uh, I said there's a number of, number of studies. I think if there's any one that you need to um, really uh, uh, take note of, it's the, this uh, study from uh, Nuremberg, where they propensity matched um, their uh, sutures valve cohort against the uh, uh, traditional valve patients, 82 in each group. And uh, not only did they demonstrate the reduced cross hand bypass times, which you might expect, but they were the first to show a reduction in ICU stay, less time on the ventilator, and uh, less usage of blood products. So advantages, you could say some soft advantages, blood products. I mean, there are many ways of uh, achieving reductions in blood product use, but I think every bit helps. Uh, what about the UK? Um, the UK was a relative, well, the CE mark for this, for the Percival valve was in January 2011. We did our first implants in April 2011. 
and then everything just just died. And the reason is there are the, the problems with funding this stuff in the UK. <coughs> but we have managed to get things going, and we're currently um, collecting the UK data uh, at Hammersmith for the last um, uh, three years. We've got 128 patients so f so far in our data set. There have been over 400 implants so now in the UK. And uh, I'll just go through some of what we've seen uh, uh, in the UK, in the real world. Um, this is not trial data. This is just what people are doing. Um, so the mean age, 78. Uh, oldest patient, 91. Um, and that just reflects the patients with aortic stenosis. But also the fact that when this started, in order to get going, you had to argue that this was really a competitor uh, with TAVI. Uh, and a TAVI valve at £16,000 a shot plus VAT. Uh, you know, people started taking you seriously when you said, well, this valve might be, this sutureless valve might be expensive, but it's going to be a lot cheaper than TAVI. And that's why those, we started off in those high risk elderly patients. NYHA class, nothing special to report. Patients had angina, 40% didn't. Um, the uh, peak mean, uh, the, the, the peak gradient uh, uh, in, the, in that group is 73, so they genuinely had a severe aortic stenosis, and uh, the majority had good ventricles. Uh, there's not a lot to say on that. Standard population, really. If you look at the logistic Euro score, uh, the mean uh, of 12, um, reflecting that elderly population by and large. And the vast majority were uh, having uh, primary surgery elective, very little use of mini stenotomy. Um, you know, I think that reflects the uh, learning curve and people's reluctance, even the enthusiasts are reluctant to, to use a new valve uh, in their mini stenotomy setting, but I think that's changing now. And uh, as I said, 34% you know, usually uh, also having a bypass grass. And what were the outcomes? In hospital mortality, uh, 7%. So for that pa patient population that we started with, uh, I think uh, that is reasonable, far outperforming the Euro score. Uh, the bypass times um, for isolated AVR just got in under an hour. And I think that's uh, a figure to take note of. With the concomitants, you know, single graft, it goes up to uh, uh, 69 minutes. And the cross count times, just under 40 minutes. So. I think that's uh, quite impressive. I think that, I've said already, people argue that this isn't a great reduction in times. But if you look at the STS database, uh, the mean cross lamp time for isolated AVR is 116 minutes. So that's real world. Yes, it's in the US. But I think that this is performing significantly better. And other important outcomes, uh, nothing very much to report. Uh, I would say no wound infections, less than 1% stroke rate so far in this UK data set. The question, though, I think that is still unanswered is the one about durability. Um, so it's the same question that bedevils TAVI, and I think it also applies to sutureless valve technology. But we do have uh, some early data. Um, so this is a multi center European uh, study published uh, published this year, um, reported last year at uh, EX. 731 patients followed up five years. No incidents of valve migration. So that's very reassuring uh, for those people who believe that you must suture something down or else it's going to move or it doesn't seem to happen. And no incidents yet of structural valve deterioration uh, and mortality stroke, paravalvular leak rate, um, all really satisfactory. Um, on durability, I think one of the things that may uh, make a difference is the, the, the design of the valve, but also the, the materials which allow the thing to move. Um, and if you have a valve housed in a very stiff stent, such like a, a sapient tabby valve, the, sh the stresses on the valve leaflets as they close are really significant, whereas if the whole thing is moving much more like an, the, the native aortic route, that should greatly reduce those stresses. And we all wait and see what the data eventually shows. But on the, this quite elegant CT scanner, you can see the whole thing moving uh, with the cardiac cycle, much more uh, conformity with, with the, the native um, aortic route. So where are we now um, in the UK? Um, uh, we've got to the point where NICE uh, deliberated, cogitated uh, as ever, and came up with guidance in uh, July uh, 2013. Um, and I'll just go through some of that. It's important just before I start just to mention, to, to dis 
to point out that uh, this guidance applies to all sutureless valves. It really didn't distinguish between the different types. Um, and uh, the first of the recommendations, uh, or, or the important comment in the first paragraph, is that there are no major concerns in the short term apart from the risk of paravalvular leak. There's no real explanation in the text of why they think there should be a significant risk of paravalvular leak. And we've seen um, uh, in that UK data set that it, uh, and in the uh, European multi study, that it's, it is not uh, a great concern. I think 1% paravalvular leak rate um, in, with a conventional sutured valve, you know, I don't think we go looking for it. I think if we went looking for it as carefully as we did with the sutureless valves, we might find 1% leak rate. I mean, most surgeons will say, oh, my valves don't leak. But actually, I think if you went looking for it, you, you would find it. Um, uh, but that's, that's what uh, NICE had to say. Um, having been on the, the NICE Technology Advisory Committee, I now understand how they work. And I now realize that whenever they produce guidance, they start off with paragraphs of motherhood and apple pie that you just cannot argue with, but which can have consequences. So one of the things that they come up with is that the sutureless valve should only be used with special arrangements for clinical governance consent and data collection or research. It suggests to me that they must think that most places are going around without having any arrangements for clinical governance, consent and data collection. But there we are. And some trusts have interpreted this as uh, meaning that you have to have a special MDT or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, whereas others have said, yeah, just carry on. Um, uh, what has been useful though, and I think much like uh, when TAVI developed, really um, uh, focus people's attention on the need to have an MDT approach uh, to this. I think we should be talking about aortic intervention across the spectrum. You know, conventional surgery, sutureless valves, TAVI, be able to offer the whole range to our patients. Um, and then the other thing they said is that when you start, uh, you should start with an experienced mentor, which I think is at least sensible. Uh, and of course, NICE is always encouraging more research. No one will fund it, but they encourage it. Um, so, uh, what are the implications of this? Well, it have, this has had um, really major implications when it comes to funding and commissioning because some commissioners have looked at this and decided that, well, NICE haven't said you have to do it, so we're not going to fund it. Uh, whereas many surgeons have said, well, NICE haven't said it's a bad thing, so I'm going to go and do it. And this, the, the standoff continues, and anyone doing uh, sutureless valve, re aortic valve replacement is really having to find their own bespoke funding arrangement. Um, I've talked about the um, implications for clinical governance uh, and uh, the important fact that you have to have a MDT approach when you start doing this. Uh, and I'll just uh, finish off with a, a, a case study. Um, we uh, presented this case at the um, our valve course uh, a few years ago. Um, so here's the patient. 90 years old, severe aortic stenosis and coronary artery disease. Uh, he's breathless. Uh, he's got some angina. Uh, he's got reasonable ventricular function, uh, no previous MIs, creatinine slightly elevated, although at his age that predicts a significantly reduced GFR. Euro score comes out at uh, nearly 20. Yes, he's 90, but the rest is pretty much what we see uh, every day. Uh, uh, echo confirmed um, severe aortic stenosis, good LV, bit of mitral stenosis, and he had a uh, significant LAD lesion, and he underwent surgery. Uh, had a, a sutures aortic valve uh, and a single bypass. Cross camp time, 45 minute, 41 minutes. Bypass time, just coming in under an hour. And at four-year follow-up, 96 years old, good valve, no angina, not breathless, good exercise tolerance, good quality of life. So I just like putting that slide up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in conclusion, I think uh, that sutures AVR technology is safe, effective, and it's reproducible. I think it's a good option for reducing, when I say the trauma of surgery, the, the, the global uh, impact of surgery. Um, you know, I think it's important when we think about things like minimally invasive surgery, uh, we shouldn't just be thinking about the access, we should be thinking about the whole picture, bypass and everything else. Um, and, and I think this uh, assists uh, in that uh, effort. There are potential cost savings. We've seen some early demonstrations of a reduced ICU stay and the like. And I suspect that this will become, I mean, I was asked to talk about the future, but I, and I suspect that this will become the default bioprosthesis for all AVR in time. I think that it'll be driven by costs. I think if the cost comes down, uh, it's so easy to use. Uh, if we have the durability data, then 
people will start asking, well, why on earth are we suturing valves in at all? Uh, just to mention, because I do sometimes work for Soren, there are other sutureless valves. Um, thank you very much. Andy, thank you very much. Um, we'll, we'll steal five minutes of the coffee break because I think this is a very good talk and a controversial area. Any, any challenges from the audience? Is this the future or not? Mr. Graham. No challenges, but some sort of observations. We were quite sort of dubious <coughs> about these valves at the start. And we've probably done over 20 of them now. But I think um, there are some sort of factors that are worth emphasizing um, maybe that, uh, that you spoke about in your talk, but that uh, other surgeons sort of practicing real-world surgeons need to think about. The very group that need a reduced bypass and cross-clamp time are the elderly because they're the ones that are affected most by prolonged times. And so uh, clearly there's a, a, a synergy there about this technology uh, in the elderly. I think also this valve allows you to put in a biological valve with an increased effective orifice area. So it allows you to get a bigger valve into a smaller route. And again, there's a, a synergy there with our small elderly ladies with small roots uh, who you might be thinking about doing a aortic root enlargement procedure in their late 70s, early 80s, which whatever people say does carry an increased risk. And thirdly, this valve is probably something that most surgeons should think about having in their armamentarium because it can be used in some um, sort of particularly difficult situations to get you out of jail. We've had a case where a, th a young man with a third time redo operation with a calcified homograft, which is probably the nightmare for most, we just took the leaflets out and were able to drop a sutureless valve in and he's 59 and he's at home. Uh, and lastly, a sort of a point that, that Mike just made uh, to me uh, during your presentation was that undoubtedly these patients do get quicker, do get better quicker. Um, and, and it is quite impressive seeing these elderly patients mobilizing uh, so quickly on the ward afterwards. Um, but a word of caution, that stent actually is 41 millimeters above the annulus. So if you do make your uh, horizontal autotomy too low, or you're trying to put proximal vein grafts on, just be very careful. You can get yourself into a little bit of difficulty, but that's uh, another presentation at another meeting. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. And that emphasizes, I suppose, the um, need for proctoring. Um, yeah. Not that I want to push your other job, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, proctoring when, you, when you're doing these. Have you found that it makes the excision of the leaflets more difficult by having a more distal high uh, on occasion, yes. Yeah. yeah, something, no question, but it's, it's rare. I mean, you can usually get a good view, go down. What, what is difficult is judging how much calcium to take out or leave behind. Yeah. Um, so and, and no one knows the optimum. No, well, no but the guys who are, have really pushed this in, in Italy and in Germany, um, who are now starting to use this as their default uh, valve, cannot afford to have paravalvular leak mm. and have therefore moved towards more aggressive decalcification was actually when this all started, the idea was as long as you left a concentric rim of, of calcium, then that was fine. And 1% paravalvular leak rate is neither here nor there. But if you really want to abolish it, then perhaps you should be more aggressive in the decalcification. And my, my worry is that um, there's no sort of randomized trial. So t to me, it would make sense. It's, a, it's a, an ideal case to randomize to a, a suture valve versus a non-sutureless. Do you know of any trials around the world that have started? Uh, no, no, but I know that we were comprehensively rejected yeah. by the UK TAVI trial, because mm. that would have been a, a good one. Um, TAVI, sutureless, conventional. Mm. But um, no, I'm not. I think just trying to emulate the cardiologists and some of their lack of perspective trial data and the steps. It's a separate talk. There's a question in the audience set. Yeah. Um, Matteo Ferrarini from Milan. Uh, we, we use uh, Percival since uh, 2010, and uh, we, we implanted a lot of it, and I agree with anything, everything you said. Um, just two, uh, two words. Uh, first, uh, uh, about the classification. The classification, in, in our opinion, has to be complete for two reasons. First, because this is the real advantage uh, uh, compared to Tavi. And uh, second, uh, because uh, 
um, the, the, the structure itself of the valve has to be, a, has to be um, implanted in a, a very, uh, in almost perfect, but uh, as most circular you can, you can obtain it. So uh, as long as there's, there's no uh, more rigid uh, section of the annulus, uh, the, 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 the valve will uh, work uh, perfectly. And a second word about the, uh, the future of the valve. Unfortunately, this uh, is uh, uh, not an everyday valve. And uh, as long as um, the manufacturer will not allow, as it doesn't now, the, the implant on uh, pure regurgitation, yeah. on bicuspid valve, uh, and uh, as long as there, uh, there will be uh, um, ex mm, excessive costs of, uh, for, for the valve, uh, it would be different. It would be difficult to just have one sutureless valves in your armamentary. Uh, with uh, um, a magna, you can do whatever, anything. With uh, Percival, not everything. So this this is probably the the, the, the most important difference. Thank yeah. you very much. I think that's important. Another question. In the absence of um, randomized data, um, how do you? What are your criteria for choosing the different options: surgery, um, sutureless valve, and TAVI? With the case you presented in many hospitals that have had just standard surgery, and in other hospitals, TAVI and PCI. So, but what are your current contemporary criteria for justifying when you put a sutureless valve in? Yeah, so there's nothing firmly established, and it's shifting sands all the time because you can always point to those places where this is just the default by prosthesis, and you go through your standard MDT, and that's that. Um, if you can afford it, you can do it. Um, but we have evolved. So when we started, as I said, it was in competition with TAVI. So it was those patients who are very high risk, uh, where they were being put forward for the TAVI MDT, but they were thought to be lowish, lowish risk for TAVI, very high risk for surgery, and those were the ones we grabbed thinking, and we made a financial case, essentially. The clinical case is very difficult to pin down because, you know, it's a free-for-all in many parts of Europe. We are actually restricted largely by funds. I, I don't have any uh, issue with implanting this in any patient who I would normally implant a, a standard uh, bi-prosthesis in, but I'm restricted by funding. So currently, it's the same implant? Yeah. In, in reality. I, I don't know what other people's experience is, but... More questions? Uh, I think this uh, valve is obviously, as Tim said, it's, it's very good to have uh, for certain cases, but I feel it is unfair to compare it to TAVI. I think you, you can already compete with TAVI in, in, in the sense that this is a, a, an option. I, I, I think this is a, a, a procedure that is done under sedation, with no excision, and you have another mm -hmm. full, you know, full spectrum cardiac surgery, so I don't think if it is valve well offers the advantage to compete with that, but I, other advantage yeah. to compete with that, another biological I, I agree entirely. I think it's just that's just where we started from. Tavi was first, then this came along, and that was the obvious comparator. But it's not really relevant now with yeah. small sheaths and. Yeah. You know. The advantage, I suppose, of comparing Tavi is the financial one yeah. that it's an expensive <laughs> valve, but it's cheaper than Tavi. <laughs> so if you want to make your case yeah. for for patients, that I think that's where the argument yeah. probably stemmed. How much more expensive is it than the standard stented? Uh, it depends on what kind of doing you can do, yeah. but uh, generally about twice the price. Yeah. Four, ten minutes shorter bypass time and five minutes shorter. Because I suspect in, in the UK, in the NHS, they're only going to take off when the price uh, comes down. Right. Um, absolutely right. Otherwise. And, unless that um, um, uh, cost effectiveness data becomes yeah. more and more robust from other places. Yeah. But you probably need randomized trials yeah, to really exactly. prove that. Sorry. Uh, just a number of questions are provoked in my mind as I was listening, listening to your presentation. One is, what do you tell your patients in terms of how long these valves are going to last? I mean, conventionally we say 10, 15 years. Mm. And do you have any experience of taking these valves out yeah. and putting another one in if it comes to that? Yeah. Or is uh, there any? So what I tell patients is that we don't know, but the basic technology is proven technology, um, and there's no evidence thus far of early structural valve deterioration. And that's just honest. I can't give them a number. 
Um, and those who go for it, go for it. And those who want to know more, actually, I don't think anyone has ever asked for a number, um, don't, don't go for it. Um, as far as taking them out, yes, I have taken out two, uh, not mine. <laughs> um, and it's uh, because it, the nitinol, <coughs> um, when it's cooled, it contracts. So you uh, just put ice slush on it, uh, move the stent together, and you can pull the thing out. So it's reasonably straightforward to take out. How long post-op was that? That was about six days post-op. So I don't, you know, they've not been in for, they're not deteriorating, so we're not explanting them um, further on. One more question from Andrew Goodwin, then we probably should um, wrap up for coffee. The middles where we went down the route of um, enable purely on cost basis because we couldn't afford the other two. And as you know, the valves now have been taken off the market. And we did take a, we found the problems, which is why it's been taken off the market. The valve was not sitting, it's, not, it's, it's a difficult valve to put in. And we had two patients having early reoperations. Um, and actually, interesting, the one I took out at three months had completely endothelialized, apart from about a centimeter along the annulus, where the valve, had, the valve obviously hadn't sat right. It was like it had been stitched in. The, the yeah. tissues around had actually grown into the valve struts. So it was actually quite difficult to get it out at, uh, at three months down the line. Um, but we have now gone across. We've Obviously, it's no longer on the market. We've gone across to the Percival. And our initial experience after about three months is it's much, much easier than the fiddling around that the enable valve used to take to get in. It's, it's much more intuitive.